I'm here with Dr. Alison Daly. Hello, Dr. Daly. Hello. I'm um, all Alison, as we prefer to call you. So, um, Alison, so um, we met when you came to uh, Adelaide, South Australia, um, and you were uh, studying anomalocarids, uh, so early Cambrian kind of things down at uh, Emu Bay, um, in particular, while you were here um, in, in on Kangaroo Island. But before we talk about that time and, and where things are at now for you, I want us to go back in time, not 500 million years, but I'm going to go back in time, Dr. Daly time. So before you became Dr. Daly, what was, what was it? What was it that got you to, like, were you, were you the kid that loved dinosaurs or bugs or biology or, or did you just wake up one day and go, oh, I'm going to be this? What? Yeah, what, what was it? Uh, I, so I guess I'm not the kid that was obsessed with dinosaurs and fossils all the time. I like, I like nature, I liked biology, I liked going out and seeing uh, animals, and I was always interested in the natural world. And uh, I started university to do a biology degree. At the time, I thought I would study genetics or even dentistry, I don't know. I took a geology course as a, an elective, an option, and fell in love with geology and plate tectonics and understanding how the earth works uh, and how we see on the surfaces the processes that happen within the earth. Uh, and at the same time, I continued to love biology. I did a geology biology double major and then said, paleontology is the perfect mix of everything I love and find interesting and inspiring in nature. And so I found paleontology, like not as a kid, but as a 20 something year old, and then just, just went for it. I, went, I had a master's in Canada. I did my PhD in paleontology and never looked back. And I can combine understanding of rocks with biology and ecology. And for me, that's, that's exciting, is mixing these two scientific fields in paleontology. And, and it's fascinating, isn't it, that, you know, you, you, you said that you had that fascination with nature and we, we find in, in all of the, the, the people I'm talking to for this series of, of chats, uh, to coincide with, with Mary Anning's 221st birthday, is, is that love of, often that love of living life, things that are alive. And that's such a great grounding um, to understand how living animals live. Um, but then for you, that the biology and geology thing, because we often get paleontologists that come from one or the other, but to kind of, I say, get a sense of both, and you talked about the ecology stuff. So, so as you were traveling through this journey, what sort of, were there difficulties, were there barriers, were there, um, because obviously when we, and we'll talk a bit about Mary Anning towards the end, you know, she had some difficulties because of, of of barriers because she wasn't a man at the time. So how did you find that? Uh, I think I was very lucky. I never felt a barrier. Maybe I'm just oblivious, I don't know. But uh, I worked always with wonderful colleagues. I had great support all the way through from my undergrad, my master's, my PhD, and my postdocs. And I never felt like I was held back. Uh, I worked really hard. I was really enthusiastic. I did my best at every turn and uh, things worked out great <laughs> for me. So, so I, I don't feel like I faced a lot of challenges just because I'm a woman or, or anything to do with my background. Of course, now uh, I have a small child and balancing family life and work life can be tricky, but uh, it's so open now and there's so many uh, sort of initiatives or actions being taken by universities across the world to ensure a good gender balance and support people in any situation. So, you know, I brought my, my baby girl when she was six months, I brought her with me in the field on field trips with undergrads, just strapped her to my front and walked around. She was napping while I was lecturing in the field, all this stuff, you know, it's, uh, it's possible, you know, it takes a bit of managing and organizing. And, uh, but you know, on the whole, I never really felt held back, which is a wonderful thing comparing back. I mean, we've made progress in 220 years, which is probably <laughs> a good thing. 
um, I, you know, Mary Anning did face so many challenges uh, because of her background, because she's a woman. And, and now, you go. No, it's just just nowadays it's obviously radically different. <laughs> yeah, and and what what's interesting too though, but I I, I think um, it's probably even changed in a generation as well. And mm. and in talking to some other folk that, um, and there's a. There's a, an American, a female American paleontologist, and she was told in the 1970s, it's like, yeah, no, 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 this is not, this is not, no, no, like, no, this is not for you. This is, this is, this is, this is what we do. You do that over there. So even in this last little while, you know, we've we've seen some changes, and 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 fantastic to see okay so you're now um, i'm speaking to you i'm i'm at dinosaur university here and you're in switzerland so you you started this journey and you 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 kind of and you've been to australia you're from canada and stuff um you spent some time in england you've probably been to the moon as well or something <laughs> but you um but you're now in switzerland so what what's what's what brought you to switzerland what's there yeah so now I'm uh, associate professor of paleontology at the University of Lausanne. Oh, so I should have introduced you as associate professor daily. Oh, that's bad of me. Associate professor, very good. Well, go on, associate professor. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because in Switzerland, uh, basically all the rocks are Mesozoic or younger. And I work on rocks that are much older than that. So I didn't come here because I'm surrounded by Cambrian rocks, unfortunately. Um, they had a job opening, quite simply. I applied and I, I came. So an aspect of an academic career, of anyone's academic career, is mobility, being flexible to travel. I'm Canadian. I did my undergrad and master's in Canada. I did my PhD in Switzerland. I did postdocs in the UK. And now I'm here. You know, so I think of it as a benefit. I love moving, I love traveling, and experiencing living in many countries is a wonderful thing about being an academic. And now here in Lausanne, I finally have a permanent job, uh, and I'm building a team where I help young people, PhD students and postdocs at the start of their career. And it's wonderful. There are many resources in Switzerland, great research funding, I have wonderful colleagues. Uh, I'm in a Earth Sciences Institute, so I can work with them. Also, there's a great biology institute at UNIL, so we can collaborate across uh, different departments. Uh, we're in a brand new building. It's fantastic. So I uh, have lots of lab space, lots of support, great colleagues, good financial uh, availabilities of funding. So really, it's, it's a wonderful and ideal place to do research. And even and if you have to travel to go see my my rocks. <laughs> so, so with with the research team that you're building, what are the and you're saying you know in Switzerland it, it's quite Mesozoic. So so what what are the 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 work that you do on early Cambrian stuff? How how's that going? And and with the students that you have, do they you know? Do you have them do Mesozoic stuff or do they do early Cambrian? Is it all, or, or is, what, what's the breadth, I suppose, of things that you're personally covering, but also you, you, obviously your students can look at? Yeah, so we have kept the focus on early evolution of animals and arthropods in particular. Uh, we do that by a couple different ways. So I, Right now, I have a big focus in my lab working on the Fezawata biota, which is actually a bit younger than uh, the Cambrian, it's early Ordovician, but super interesting because we see Cambrian animals preserved together with more normal Paleozoic things like cephalopods and so on. So it's kind of a mix of communities. It's a transitional period from a, a Cambrian sea full of weird, weird, weird early animals and then more typical, longer-lived uh, animals from the Paleozoic that are s more similar to what we see today. So uh, we acquired a huge collection of these fossils from Morocco uh, through connections there, actually working really closely with collectors 
uh, like Mary Anning, who live near the fossil site in Morocco and spend all of their time going out to the field and collecting. It's, it's so crucial as a paleontologist to work with people who know the area, live in the area, and are collecting all the time. Um, so we work closely with collectors. We have a big collection now in Lausanne, and my team is working on those fossils. We're also doing lab work where we try to understand fossilization processes by taking modern animals, killing them, and watching how they decay in controlled conditions in the lab. So we've started a whole experimental line um, where we're studying taphonomy, which is just the processes of fossilization in the very, very early stages. And part of that was, was interest, of course, in the questions, but also I mentioned before this life work balance. You know, I wanted also research to be happening where I didn't have to go to the field 10 times a year and travel all over the world while I have a young child at home. So part of it was also managing, you know, a, a balance of, of research that we can do in Switzerland, even if we're not surrounded by uh, old, old rocks from the Paleozoic that we work on, uh, but we can still address really important questions of how do we get soft tissues? How do we get guts preserved with the last meal still there? How are we getting Cambrian brains preserved? So we can really look at that uh, in the lab by doing some of these kind of disgusting decay experiments as well. So we, we have two angles to the work that we're doing and that's how we've adapted to having a team in Switzerland when we're not so much working on Swiss rocks. And in the long run, yeah, I could see having projects on Mesozoic. Uh, local Swiss fossils. I'd love that, but uh, maybe that just takes a bit of time to get to know the area, get to know the rocks, get to know the fossils. Fantastic. That's really cool. So now what I want to do, of course, now is, is because we're having these chats to do with, with Mary Anning 221 years ago. She was born in 1799. So, um, Growing up, did you know of her story? What what did you know? And did was she somebody that you're going, oh, that's a that's a hero, or was it just a, an incidental character? What what did you know of her growing up? Um, I, I think growing up, I don't think I heard of her. To be honest, I heard of her first maybe during my studies when I started really getting into paleontology, and of course her story is inspiring. You know, she's, for the time period when she was working and the work that she did, which was dangerous and hard work, going out every day to the beach, trying to uncover these fossils, uh, discover these amazing fossils uh, on the Dorset coast, often after huge storms had, had caused rock, rock uh, falls and exposed new fossils. I mean, she was, she was really inspirational. I found her story super inspirational during the, especially the early stages of my career. Um, I worked a little bit, or I wasn't sort of involved with some initiatives by um, Susie Maidment and Tori Herridge, who are uh, female paleontologists in the UK who started initiatives like Trowel Blazers, which is a fantastic website where they celebrate women paleontologists and archaeologists of all ages. and. Uh, it's incredible these stories often overlooked of the amazing contributions that women have made to these fields uh, where they're trying to sort of shed a light on some of these lesser known um, women who really contributed but maybe for the time period it wasn't recognized because of the barriers that existed a hundred or two hundred years ago so i guess she's more of an inspiration to me now as an adult than as a child but you know what, my daughter, she definitely knows about Mary Anning already. <laughs> That's fantastic. And it is, isn't it? Because people growing up would see, uh, and, and less so your generation and the generations to come, but a lot of generations grow up and they see scientists like looking, looking like this. The, mm -hmm. This is the role model. And it's like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be this. Mm -hmm. I and mean, this is pretty okay, but it, it, there's this so many more people with skills and intelligences and all those sorts of things. Okay, so that's really cool to hear about the, the, the personal kind of connection. The other thing I want to ask about uh, your thoughts on Mary is, is so where do, you, where do you think she sits? What, what's her legacy? Where does she sit as a, as a historical character or as a, I mean, because technically she's not a scientist and 
some people say, oh, she wasn't a paleontologist. Well, she would have been if she could have joined the geological society. So don't, don't give us that rubbish. Um, but but where, where do you think she sits? Well, I, I think part of her legacy, of course, is the specimens. Uh, we can see her specimens on display in many museums around the world. Some of the most important first discoveries uh, of these specimens. But, you know, paleontology really comes down to looking at fossils. And these can take months to extract and even longer to prepare, which she, which she did. She put in those hours of labor and the, the fossils are absolutely beautiful. And some of them were critically important for our early understanding of, of uh, uh, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, uh, uh, you know, marine reptiles, these, these early creatures. I'm not a vertebrate paleontologist, but I think that her work there still resonates today and people are still looking at her material. And from what I understand of reading about her, she was a fabulous, um, she had a fabulous understanding of anatomy of these creatures and people consulted with her and um, you know male paleontologists who were in the geological society they valued her opinion um, you know they they listened to her knowledge because that knowledge came from hours days weeks months of just staring at the fossils and there is no replacement for that I think even today just staring at specimens getting as much information as possible from these fossils. Fantastic tribute to her. Thank you, Associate Professor Daly. Um, wonderful to speak to you. Enjoy Switzerland. Um, and uh, happy birthday, Mary Anning. Yeah, indeed, 221 years young.